Welcome everybody to the aerospace and aviation session. Um, I'm your chair, Professor Ian Youngs from, from DSTL. I'd like to uh, introduce you to, to the agenda we're going to work through uh, over the next 90 minutes. Um, so I'm going to provide uh, an overview of DSTL and metamaterials just to get us going and then provide uh, a bit of a sector overview um, from a civil sector perspective, which is a bit of a a new opportunity for, for me. <clears throat> then I'll hand over to uh, a couple of our other speakers. We have uh, Dr. Kevin Mitchell from Kinetic, who's going to give some perspectives on, on metamaterials for, for this sector. And then on to uh, Mike Sloan from Technical Composite Systems, uh, who's going to talk about uh, metamaterial composites and their applications and opportunities. We'll then have a few words from uh, Martin Agnew from Airba Air Airbus Defence and Space. Uh, limited before we move into a panel discussion where we'll pick up your questions uh, uh, that, that you please submit uh, throughout the presentation. So you can post questions uh, all the way through as, as we're speaking um, and uh, we'll pick them up at the end. The other point I wanted to just uh, remind, I guess mainly the, the speakers, is that we are recording this session so people can view it back uh, through the portal uh, uh, later on during the event. <clears throat> so I just thought I'd set the scene. Um, what I hope you'll get for, from this session and in the context of, of the aerospace and aviation sector is that metamaterials are relevant. Uh, they are potentially revolutionary and uh, it's, it's time to start exploiting them now. So I hope my slides in particular share some confidence established from R&D in the defence sector uh, and uh, the session overall demonstrates that the challenges and opportunities are largely common with civil sector opportunities, so a very dual use area, and that we sow some seeds for ideas, connections, and, and questions for the panel later on. So it's just useful to reflect quickly on, on why uh, this is important. Um, and I guess the government sets uh, an agenda um, under the strap line of strategic advantage through science and technology. So on this slide, I've just highlighted a few of those uh, sort of government and, and defence uh, policy and strategy documents that uh, are very current and set the scene for, for that uh, strategic position and then connect it through to important families of, of technology, both in uh, defence technology framework uh, and the UK's uh, recent innovation strategy, highlighting materials uh, and metamaterials within that as an important technology family uh, for applications across uh, all, both these sector areas. The other uh, factor on the slides is, um, it is about trusted research and, and I guess linked in with strategic advantage through s and um, It's very much also about spotting the opportunities, getting the investment uh, in place to support those things, but also being aware of, of developing that advantage and, and uh, being conscious of, of what you're sharing. So also linked uh, on this slide, but if you visit the, um, the DSTL booth, um, there's a download of a, of a new pamphlet from CPNI, the Centre for Protection of National Infrastructure, on, on some of the, the things that you should bear in mind uh, when you're sort of breaking out into the world in these application spaces um, and engaging globally. So it's just worth very quickly reflecting on, on, on sort of metamaterial journey over time. Uh, these sorts of materials uh, have been of interest and named as metamaterials for, for about 20 years now. So in that context, 
uh, you know, as a, as a median or, or mean view for hardware based technology, you really expect to, after 20 years, it's starting to break through into to products and, and applications in, in the market. So Metal Materials has that pedigree and timing to, for, for that to, to be relevant for a conference of this nature today. And um, people are also kind of really interested in a range of, of emerging technologies and, uh, you know, that how does Metal Materials stack up in the context of some of those things like quantum computing, synthetic biology, graphene and things like that. So I've just pulled out a little bit of data here that demonstrates that Metal Materials is in that that league alongside those emerging technologies uh, and some other data which, which shows that you know the global competitiveness for, from the sort of academic feed if you like of, of science and technology feeding into this um, position of the UK relative to, to the other major players as I think Sir John pointed out in the plenary of, of the US and China uh, and, and just to sort of emphasize it's not a new thing it's it's coming of age um, the UK Foresight Review in 2004 uh, talked about the subject in its Exploiting the Electromagnetic Spectrum paper, and uh, it uh, looks back at that uh, 10 years on um, and highlighting you know, some of the things that this KTN network and, and the conference is about it is bridging into the commercial applications. Yet where are those going to be? Uh, and it's very complicated because it's a, a diverse technology field. That, that will match up with a diverse application field. But you'll see in that, uh, through, through that sort of formative stage from a UK perspective as a government department, the MOD uh, was kind of uh, volunteered to, to sort of perhaps look after that to a degree and engage with, with that sector. So this next slide just provides um, sort of an, a, a, just a snapshot of, of some of that journey over, over the last sort of 10 or 15 years for defence and engaging with, with academic uh, programmes, um, some international research, I'll come back to that in a second, um, but building up through, through large programme grants with multi-centres multi involved, looking at a wide range of things from discovery, design, manufacture, and trying to connect to the application concepts, developing talent uh, through, for example, the Doctoral Training Centre at Exeter, and then some other specific grants that, that have uh, probably just finished now. But you see some examples in the DSTL booth of some of the current PhD work that we're sponsoring to keep in touch with the, the sort of science and technology frontiers of the subject. This is quite an old example, which some, some of you will see me mention before at various events. Um, it, it dates back uh, probably about uh, 10 years now or so, where we undertook a project uh, with the French, with, with industry and academic partners, really addressing that sort of basic question, um, do metamaterials make a difference to antenna design? Um, are they revolutionary or evolutionary? And we looked at a, a range of possible application scenarios, um, SATCOM, uh, global navigation, uh, electronic surveillance, uh, identifications, sort of friend foe type, type applications. We looked at um, the GNSS application uh, in more detail and, and did a comparison between a, a benchmark patch antenna and a metamaterial equivalent to demonstrate sort of some gains in, in um, miniaturization and, and gains in bandwidth uh, and the possibility of getting close to, to tackling dual band capability. To, to address at that time what was considered to be a feature of this class of metamaterials based on high impedance surfaces, that they're a very niche sort of narrow band type of technology. Uh, and since then, that, that kind of uh, myth has been, been largely thrown out. Moving on to um, sort of test the market a bit further and the transition from, from academia to, to industry, we embarked on a, a defence uh, accelerator competition on, on meta surfaces over the period shown here. Uh, and as, as I've said, it was both to, to sort of help us identify further game changing concepts. Um, to help us build in uh, and broaden the uh, engagement of, of um, MOD R&D programmes beyond our materials programme, and as I said, test the emergence uh, for, from academia to industry. So we funded uh, a range of different themes there, um, from functional materials for antennas, things to do with non-mechanical beam steering, uh, new electromagnetic coatings and novel fabrication techniques, so quite a wide range. We broadened that out into a range of uh, connections to, to other mod programs, 
shows the diversity of of, um, of interest that 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 is there for, for meta materials and, and their applications. And uh, some of the, the data shows that the kind of balance um, of, of the, the the proposals that were submitted and the proposals that were funded between academia, large, small, and micro companies. So there's some indication of, of movement from academia to industry, but still quite dominated by, by academic contributions in that phase. So really important what we have in an event like this today. Um, if people are interested to find out more about where MAD is going, um, one document is, is linked off of this slide. It's a, a pre-competitive prior information notice that was put out um, in November. It talks about the possibility that we're considering to, to, to engage with centres of excellence in uh, for materials for extreme physical environments, but also materials for the congested electromagnetic environment. And of course, um, physical assets need to, to work in, in both of those environments, which is why we see it as really important coupling those two themes together. So to, to just look at um, a particular um, application area, really focusing in on the electromagnetic operating environment. So the schematic of that in the center of the slide characterizes some of the aspects of that environment, how dynamic it is, how complex it is, how congested it is. And, and those are all you know, common factors with the civil sector. I guess uh, for, for defense, the contested thing comes in a bit more. And there's some ideas of the sorts of capabilities that are important at the bottom of that section. So where does some of the metamaterial work that we've been exploring fit into that? Uh, antenna and communications type of situation, but it's about the efficiency, the resilience, the capacity of those systems. Uh, and I've just highlighted a few of the examples of, of metamaterials in that from, from looking at spatial diversity with metamaterial lenses, as is shown on the right, um, and PhD, which you can see a little bit more of in, in the booth, um, looking at can we wirelessly control meta atoms. To, to make a, a reconfigurable microwave meter surface so you don't have to have all the control lines in the system. Uh, and then uh, another example, which I'll, I think I'll touch on in, in the next slide, kind of how, how do you make uh, antennas more conformal uh, and, uh, and still work well um, with, with novel ground planes? And I think Mike's talk will, will touch into that sort of area as well. So, so this slide's kind of important for, for two things. It reminds me to, to say, well, you can bring a, a dipole antenna right up to, to the surface and integrate it within the surface of, of a vehicle um, and retain the gain characteristics and, and, and other characteristics through, through novel ground planes. Um, but you also have to go through a manufacturing journey to realize um, such highly tailorable materials. And that's what, what uh, you know, collaboration with, with our US counterparts has demonstrated with, with their technology known as Metaferrite, uh, and they put that through quite substantial manufacturing technology programs to, to make that uh, a, a realistic material for prototyping. And as you can see on the images on the right, the conventional uh, SATCOM antenna, which is a cross dipole spaced off from, from the ground plane, it is uh, replicated by, by a flat plate that, that you, you know, to all intents and purposes, you wouldn't realize there is an antenna bedded into it. Um, so I'll probably skirt over these. Um, just some indications for, from so working with BA systems and, and the next slide with MBDA, to, particularly the integration of sensing and communications capabilities into air platforms is really important. And, and the slides kind of highlight some of the, the benefits. This one perhaps most about uh, the RF side. Uh, and from the MBDA perspective, thinking a bit more about thermal imaging technologies and the difference that metamaterial concepts can make to, to, the, to the performance, to the form factor uh, and, and the integration aspects. Maybe, maybe you don't need a gimbaled um, sensor anymore, um, which makes a tremendous savings. So my closing slide for, for the sort of DSTL component of, of this introduction, uh, apologies, it's a fairly complicated chart really serves to, to, to introduce the, the very diverse and dual use nature of, of metamaterials and their connection to applications. I've kind of given a sector breakdown around the middle and the items sort of closer in are perhaps higher maturity uh, and the ones around the edge are perhaps uh, slightly 
longer term expectations. But in yellow, perhaps some of the outcome uh, concepts, at least as, as labels as to whether that's playing to, to energy efficiency or you know, just changing some of the enablers like platform design and form factor um, and, and communications type capabilities. So I'll just take a breath and then I'll move on to, to give a bit of an overview of uh, so some of the civil sector drivers just to set the scene for, for hopefully some discussion. So as I move into this, um, I'd like to acknowledge some, some important contributions to the next slide from, from Alex Hickson from the Aerospace Technology Institute, from Hannah Abson from, from KTN in relation to the future flight challenge, uh, for, from Nick and, and uh, Martin who will talk a bit more uh, later on and from, from colleague Laura Jones and uh, also from the KTN and some of the space related aspects that I'll touch on. So kind of apologies for some of those who, who weren't able to, to join the session today, um, but hopefully I'll capture the, the essence of that uh, sufficiently for our discussion. So what I want to sort of step through in a few slides is a little bit of a view uh, from, the, from the ATI, I guess, in terms of aerospace and aviation. I'll say a few things about the space environment uh, and then perhaps sort of trying to really open up our imagination around future, future flight and the nature of, of, of perhaps local and regional um, kind of air, air platforms and interaction with, with society um, to, to end with. So obviously one of the, or perhaps the major driver for, for everyone uh, now is the net zero uh, issue the climate change issue and, and achieving net zero by 2050. So, so that's really sort of front and center in, in this. Um, so those of you who aren't familiar, the Advanced Technology Institute, um, yeah, it is, is the sort of national entity that, that leads the development of, of the uh, sort of industrial R&T investment from, from government to support, support the sector uh, and go on these missions. So the vision for, for UK Aerospace is to be globally, to maintain sort of global competitiveness for our industry uh, and leading technologies um, and, and lead on to, to the world's most sustainable commercial aircraft. Uh, and the mission of that investment is to, is to help the sector accelerate to, to high value technologies that, that have high environmental impact uh, and support the economy and, and society. Um, I guess the ATI owns the National Aerospace Technology Strategy, uh, I guess, slightly poor timing for this event. We're you know, just waiting for, for publication of, of an updated uh, uh, strategy in that space. So, so look out for that one. So I guess one of the, the key programs or, or, or not notable programs is Fly Zero um, that ATI is, is, uh, has introduced, it's, you know, it's underway, aiming to realize zero carbon emission from commercial aviation by 2030. So, a very demanding time frame um, involving the, the, the community. So I won't try to, to explain it in, in detail. Um, it's, it's an initiative that, that commenced uh, last year. Uh, and I guess in terms of air platforms, air vehicles, it's focused in, in aircraft that, that might be single aisle or regional and, and have ranges of in, in, in the vicinity of 500 to 1500 nanometers. So it just sort of scales the, the context just thinking, you know, with some input from Nick and Nick Crew from, from Airbus, some of the opportunities for metamaterials in that context, likely to be around light weighting, the structures, but also the power and data cabling, a lot of weight tied up in there. Um, so, so maybe concepts linked to, to something that, uh, you know, metaboards were talking about or, or, or other and similar concepts might really transform the nature of power and data transmission in those structures and lead to to like weighting benefits, which has you know, cascade in, in terms of uh, energy efficiency, uh, maybe uh, uh, to, to tackle noise issues as well. So linking through and thinking a bit more about the efficiency of flight, uh, the integration of sensors and comms link um, is likely to, to make aircraft or could make aircraft more efficient in their flight. Um, you can think about functional materials uh, linked to metamaterials concepts that might come to play to to improve power electronics for more electric aspects of, of aircraft. Uh, and perhaps a really important one is around thermal management in propulsion systems for electronics, but also thinking about alternate 
fuels and their supply chains in connection with the industry, such as you know the whole hydrogen uh, fuel uh, opportunity um, and, and potentially the need to transport that as, as a in a cryogenic state uh, and so on. But also not forgetting, I guess, physical aspects of cybersecurity, sort of anti-jamming, anti-interference type of things for, for communication systems. Uh, probably possibly a lot of potential there. So just to highlight um, some of the areas that the ATI fund is captured on this slide, I guess one of the important ones in terms of that translational space and, and early project space is, is, is for SMEs and competitions through, through the NATEC scheme, um, collaborative R&D, et cetera. And, uh, Mike's uh, project to he'll refer to falls under that category. So I now move on to just say a few words about space applications. It's obviously for the UK, a um, very growing area um, in terms of, sort of policy and strategy space, but also for, for industry. I've captured some of, some of the sort of statements about that here, I guess. Um, ambition to capture 10% of the world market uh, over the next decade. Uh, but the UK is in a sort of strong manufacturing position, producing 20% of satellites in orbit and uh, you know, developing the path to be able to launch satellites from the UK um, for, from now on. Um, of course, sort of adding to that civil picture, um, MOD set up UK Space Command uh, last year as well to, to, um, to drive that harder and uh, have, have a sort of more independent indigenous capabilities. Um, so just thinking about the space environment, launch operations in space and the applications there, um, probably offers some unique challenges for materials. And some of those might have solutions associated with metamaterials. So in my next slide, um, just think about some of, some of those possibilities. This is not an exhaustive list. It's again, just some seeds for people to think about. So perhaps very different and non-linear um, thermal conditions, uh, think about thermal cycling of satellites in orbit and other space structures, they really go between extremes. So can metamaterials help with, with thermal management in that context? Um, very high vibration environment during launch, um, but a very uh, constrained sort of volume and mass uh, situation in terms of payloads. So uh, again, I think so John mentioned uh, something about uh, you know, acoustic materials and, and, and um, reducing their size in his talk. So could acoustic metamaterials offer compact vibration suppression and isolation solutions and systems? Can you think about the sort of ionizing radiation or just the general radiation environment in, in space also being quite challenging? Another area to think about in terms of radiation hardening and shielding. Uh, I've already touched on mass efficient deployable structures. They're really crucial for, for getting uh, capability into space. So the mechanical metamaterials area may come to play in that. And you know, antennas aren't unique to, to space, but you know, can metamaterials produce and, and enable optimization of, of the best performance an, antennas uh, to operate in the extreme environments encountered in space? Another aspect, uh, another path for, for thinking about what metamaterials can do. So I think in, in this slide, on its own, it really reinforces that that kind of um, landscape map that I that I showed before, and if linking that through to the, to the aerospace type of sector, it's not just about some of the direct uses of of, of metamaterials. They come into to challenges that are, that are in some of the technical detail. It reinforces the diversity of, of the needs and, and the diversity of metamaterials that, that can be considered for this sector. So moving on to, to the final section uh, uh, for me in terms of the future flight challenge. Um, so this is, uh, the image really shows the futuristic nature of, of lots of autonomous uh, land and air vehicles operating, some conventional stuff maybe, if you look at the bus and, and obviously people interacting with that environment. It's a very sort of future, but maybe not too far future view in, in that image. So the future flight challenge is an industrial strategy challenge fund investment from government uh, over a four-year period and it's, it's now moving into its demonstration phase. It's quite a large program um, involving industry and it's, it's really trying to, to start the process of positioning the UK to, 
to deliver products to, to capitalize and, and to, to benefit from, from this area as is conveyed by the picture. Um, it's a very sort of socioeconomic situation. So I think one of the slides I've, I've got sort of really picks up on, on the benefit drivers here, quite a wide range, which I think is a good stimulus. Um, as I think Irina talked about, you know, thinking about the, the need rather than just pushing metamaterials and, and is metamaterials the right solution. So, so that's sort of covered on this slide again, sort of highlighting the diversity of, of the types of structures and vehicles to, to build and then integrate capabilities into, whether that's the propulsion system or you know, it has to be able to sense uh, and, and receive communications to, for command and control, particularly if it's a, autonomous vehicles. Um, so I won't try and read through there, but just highlight the, the need for, for enablers to achieve these things in, in designing, building and operating them as a diverse set. Uh, again, reminding you about the, the increased complexity and congested nature that's evoked by, by this scenario. It's very dynamic. Um, it's a physical one. Um, you need to think about acoustics as well as the electromagnetic environment. And uh, obviously, energy demands um, need to be dealt with and, and dealt with efficiency efficiently and, and with efficient use of resources. So being able to, to miniaturize without losing capability to be able to have more flexibility and form factor that metamaterials enables um, all starts to play into to that, I think. And again, this, this slide just uh, highlights not just taking a view at the component level or the system level, really thinking about the system of systems, the whole system, the ecosystem it's operating in. Um, that's both a need and an opportunity space. Um, and, and that's thinking about what the operating model is going to be like, what's the regulation structure, what's the infrastructure that needs to go around it, sort of touching on things like, you know, if it's a different fuel uh, system like hydrogen, as, as well as the aircraft systems themselves. I just added to the, to the slide some of the high level um, sort of roadmap priorities that, that the programme's uh, been looking at across some of those, those themes. And you'll pick up you know, quickly things to do with communications and sensing uh, and energy uh, through, through that. So I think that, that brings me to, to a close uh, on my introduction. I'll just come back to, to this sort of slide to just remind us to think in a dual use perspective, at least for anyone from the defence sector, um, and, and think about the diversity of this and, and some of the bullet points down the side. Efficiency, form factor, functionality, they're all things that metamaterials start to open up in ways that have not been possible. Um, in many ways, some people talk about being able to reach beyond the limits uh, of, of what people are used to in, in the design space. And to think about it at the component level, the system level, and the, and the ecosystem level. So I'll close there and then hand over to, I hope, Kevin, um, who, who's going to talk for, from his perspective. Thank you for listening. Okay. Thanks very much, Ian. Uh, I wonder if we can have my slides just brought up. That'd be grand. Ah, lovely. Um, first thing I'm going to start with is what you're not supposed to start with, which is an apology, uh, because uh, the, the, there is going to be some overlap between what I'm going to say and what Ian's just said. And uh, I think that the, the good way to look at that is that if two people are coming to the same sort of, two organisations are coming to the same sort of conclusions independently, then hopefully we're both right. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> thanks. Uh, we'll start off just with a, a couple of general comments on taking metamaterials and uh, applying them to the aerospace industry. And in particular, I'm thinking of moving from academia, where the UK in particular is very, very strong. We've got a lot of work going on. It's all good stuff. But the question is really for the benefit of the UK and similar, uh, uh, similar uh, considerations apply uh, internationally as well, is how do we get that good work in academia into industry and actually contributing to 
gross domestic product, making us all better off. That's 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 what we're trying to do. So one of the first things that uh, again Ian's already touched upon is that it, it's all very well in in aerospace and looking at a meta material application and saying, well, if we take the example of an antenna, I've applied meta materials to this antenna, and look, I can scan it. 20 degrees further than is feasible with conventional systems. So I've made my system better. Or for example, I can now work from this single antenna over a much wider bandwidth efficiently than is possible with conventional technology. And that's great. You know, that, that's, that's all good stuff. But in the context of aerospace, you have to look at the system in the round. So if those improvements are coming at the cost of uh, increased demands for power, increased weight, increased demands for, for, for volume on an air vehicle, it's unlikely that they're going to be adopted. So we really need to think about the system and the metamaterial application in aerospace in the round take into account not just a single performance parameter, but how that development is going to affect our aerospace vehicle or aerospace system uh, uh, as a whole. And one of the good things about metamaterials is that quite fortunately, um, in, in a large number of, uh, of applications, uh, they, they do tick that box, they do meet that requirement. So not only do they offer us higher performance in terms of uh, structural strength to weight or, or better system connectivity for a comm system, for example, but they don't adversely impact on the other aspects of that system. And in fact, they can often make our size, weight, power, and indeed cost requirements uh, more amenable. They can improve things there. So that's the first sort of point uh, that I think is worth making. And it does echo some of the things Ian's just been saying. Uh, and another issue, and we're, we're uh, addressing the aerospace sector as a whole today. Um, so we got uh, the defence sector and the civil sector, and a lot of the early work in the application of metamaterials has been uh, related to defence applications. And I think there's a few reasons for that. Uh, that the, in terms of defence, the threat that you face is always changing. Uh, there's a need to, to, to keep abreast of those threats. Very often in, in, in looking at defence applications, we're not looking at a single performance parameter. We're looking at multiple parameters and we need to address them all at the same time. And as I've just alluded to, quite often metamaterials can allow us to meet all of those requirements, to improve all of those parameters simultaneously. And that's a key aspect, I think, of getting the best out of metamaterials. And the other thing, of course, is that uh, at least in the UK, and I think it's certainly true in the United States as well, uh, there are existing paths for research and development associated with uh, the defence sector that have perhaps picked up on the applications of metamaterials. And yes, yeah, Ian's just shown some work that I was aware of uh, many years ago. Uh, so I think that, that that's very much the case. But that is changing. And we've just seen some examples of where uh, um, certainly the UK government is keen to start pushing uh, the, the advantages or the investigation of metamaterials where we're learning to address the civil sector. And the sort of thing we've got to be aware of is that in general terms, if we go back decades, the defence market has, has shrunk in terms of number of number of vehicles, number of applications, whereas in aerospace, the civil sector has expanded. Uh, things have taken a bit of a hit over the last couple of years, obviously. But it's generally the case that uh, the, the civil market in aerospace is the one that's expanding. And those key challenges are efficiency and that reduced reliance on fossil fuels that, uh, uh, that we've just uh, uh, just been talking about. Now, in terms of the pictures on, on the right hand side of the slide, what I wanted to do actually was to, uh, to, to, to address a point I'm going to make on the next slide, which is that the aerospace sector is diverse and it's hugely diverse. So the, 
the little red and yellow vehicle on, on, on the upper picture is, uh, is a target drone. Uh, it's got a top speed of about 200 miles an hour. It's not necessarily designed to come back. Are there applications of metamaterials to that aircraft? Well, actually, yes, there are. Um, we go further down, and we've got a representative from, from, from Airbus with us today, but at Kinetic, we also make uh, satellites, in Belgium, I should say. Uh, and are there applications for metamaterials to satellites? Well, yes, there are. Are the drivers for those applications the same as for a target drone? No, they're not. They're completely different. Uh, so we do have to be aware that the aerospace sector is hugely diverse. It's very, very wide spread indeed. Okay. Um, uh, if we could have the, uh, the, the next slide then, please. Thank you very much. So uh, as I've, I've just been talking about, in aerospace, we've got a huge range of different applications. We could be talking about hand-launched drones that uh, say a fire brigade or a coast guard might want to use to assist in their rescue activities. And there'll be a set of drivers uh, associated with that sort of application. That would be completely different, a completely different set of drivers requirements to making missiles for the defense market or making long endurance uh, uninhabited air vehicles or making combat aircraft or civilian training aircraft where the emphasis may be on efficiency and safety uh, and again there's a different set of, uh, of drivers of requirements to um, airliners uh, we, we contribute largely to the uh, or hugely to the to, to, to the Airbus uh, uh, product line from the UK uh, and there's a huge demand on uh, on efficiency there um, but I probably can say this without giving away too many commercial secrets I did a secondment to Airbus many years ago where um, there was much angst about uh, a particular component and uh, how the, the number of those components could be reduced, and they weighed each 28 grams. So as, uh, as a well-known supermarket says, every little helps. And again, we can go on to satellites where we just talked about, or Ian's just talked about, the, the very extreme uh, environmental conditions that pertain there. So the point really I'm trying to make is that, yes, there will be lots of applications to the aerospace sector for metamaterials, but it's a very, very wide sector, and uh, we, we have to bear that in mind. So what's another uh, particular challenge associated with aerospace? Well, it's one I've already touched on, and that's simultaneous requirements. And uh, a very good example, um, if you look at the open literature, you'll see people trying to apply metamaterials to uh, cockpit canopies in combat aircraft. And not only are they looking to uh, and ensure that these things are very highly optically transparent, as pilots like to see out. Uh, they're also looking to control the radar signature aspects of that canopy, and also its infrared uh, attributes as well. And to be successful in that particular application, at least according to that particular paper, you have to address all three at the same time. And that's actually quite common within aerospace. Again, we've already touched on the operating environment. That can be extreme. So when we're taking our metamaterial idea, our metamaterial technology out of the laboratory through research and development into some sort of product, we really have to be aware of the environment it's going to meet from, if not day one, from very, very early on in the process. Uh, and that environment can change. The environment for a, that'll be met by a drone flying at 200 miles an hour is going to be completely different to that associated with the satellite. And then, of course, there's manufacturing considerations. If we're successful with our metamaterial application to aerospace, we may need to make these things in very large quantities. Or indeed, we might need to make individual metamaterial components 
with dimensions measured in tens of meters rather than tens of microns. So if we're going to transition from the laboratory to industry to real product, manufacturing needs to be taken into consideration again from early on. And that's something that's happening uh, through the good offices of the, the UK government and KTN and Innovate UK, that's already happening. Another consideration, quality control and certification. The aerospace sector is very, very closely regulated and for very good reason. So we've got to have, if, if we're going to apply metamaterials to an aerospace product, to an aerospace platform, we must have a way of making sure that what we're making is certifiable, that it does meet the required quality control standards. And that's again, something that can often be missed if we concentrate on just the pure performance aspects of a metamaterial, rather than treating it from day one as a product. Another very important aspect is through life support and repair. If, for example, we've uh, got a, a really excellent antenna and uh, we've incorporated into the structure of an aerospace vehicle, it's got excellent performance as, a, as an antenna, it's, uh, it's reducing weight, it's reducing requirement for volume, so it, it gets on the airplane platform uh, through, through, through those aspects as well. How do we tell if it's still working? And if it's not, how do we repair it? Because we probably don't want to take a large section of that aerospace platform, whether it's a drone, whether it's a new one, we don't, we don't want to take that section off and replace it with a new one because our antenna isn't working anymore. And then there's the other aspect of, let's say the requirement for that antenna system, let's say it's a comm system, let's say that changes through the life of an airliner. An airliner might be in service for three or four decades. How are we going to ensure that in a cost-effective manner, we can change how that system performs without having to replace a large chunk of the aircraft structure? So we need to bear those things in mind again, really right at the beginning, if we're making that transition from, uh, from, from the laboratory, from low TRL demonstrations of how metamaterials can improve performance. If we're going to make that transition to product, to things that are used in real product that people are going to buy, we have to keep these, uh, keep these things in, 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 in mind. Okay, so if I can have the next, uh, next slide, please. So let's look at a few of the applications for, uh, for, for metamaterials in aerospace. And uh, one thing I will say is that, uh, I'll touch very briefly on each of these applications, but kinetic to one level of another or another is active now today in each one of these aerospace applications. So in terms of structures, are we making metamaterial structures? Yes, we are. In terms of aerospace, what are the advantages? Lightweight, high strength. Uh, we, we've got the ability to direct stress waves away from sharp corners. That might end up opening up completely new design options for, for, for aerospace designers. Uh, we can combine uh, structural strength with the ability to, to, to damp vibration. Um, again, looking at that multifunctionality. Um, and as we've already touched on, we can take a piece of structure and add the ability to conduct microwave communications, um, or we can actually replace some of the existing cabling that goes into aircraft um, for the transfer of data. Uh, we can look at acoustics. Uh, again, we're, we're, we're active in acoustic metamaterials. And we're looking again at saying, how can we improve the, 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 the in the civil application, how can we improve the, the, the passenger environment and the, the crew environment by reducing noise? How can we do that at reduced impact in terms of weight and volume? Metamaterials offer some solutions there. And that's an area where we're, we're active. Antennas and radomes have already been touched upon. Uh, there, are, there is huge potential for the use of um, metamaterials in, in, in providing better antennas and better radomes in the civil and indeed the, the defence markets. Um, but we can also use metamaterials not only to improve 
the, the performance aspects of that, uh, of say uh, bandwidth or efficiency, but the whole system in terms of how it pertains, how it impacts on the, the area space vehicle. So in other words, we can improve size, weight, power, potentially cost requirements at the same time. Uh, I'll touch on data transfer, uh, cabling that links all of the avionics and sensors on an aircraft, uh, imposes a large volume and a weight penalty, and indeed a large uh, maintenance overhead as well. You've got to keep checking that they're still working and get in there and repair them. Um, can we use metamaterial technology to reduce some of that? That might be through the use of terahertz antennas that are, provide us with an efficient way of transferring data without the need for cables. Or it might be the use of surface waves and similar technologies to reuse aircraft structure to carry that data. Can we do that? Yes, we can. Um, so we can nip on to the next slide, please. Uh, other aspects, EMC and lightning protection. Can we use metamaterials to uh, ensure that we have a good standard, a required standard of EMC protection in an aircraft at lighter weight and lower volume? Yes, we can. Are there ways of using metamaterials to offer better lightning protection? Yes, there are. And again, that can be combined with, for example, improved structural characteristics. And I show an example of that top right there. Radar signature control, usually just uh, uh, applies to the defense sector, but can we use metamaterials to, uh, to improve our radar signature control aspects of an air vehicle or indeed make them worse in the case of a target? Uh, yes, we can. Can we do that lower weight and volume and potentially cost? Yes, we can. Can we integrate that into structure? Yes, we can. Thermal control has just been touched on. Can we offer thermal insulation at lower cost in terms of weight and volume using metamaterials? Yes. Yes, we can. Um, we, sometimes we can take advantage of some of the novel properties available to us, such as selective direction of heat flow, um, sending heat into different heat sinks, or non-reciprocal properties, so we only dump heat when we really need to. Metamaterials allow us to do that in the aerospace uh, context as well. And again, we, we, we can look at uh, how metamaterials help us in the optical and infrared domain. Uh, in terms of defense, they can help us to control infrared signature, either in passive form or dynamic. Um, we can also adopt metamaterial technology to help protect the air crew against uh, malicious use of lasers. Again, it's lightweight and low volume. So there's a really wide range of applications for metamaterials in aerospace. At Kinetic, we're active in all of them. Um, and I think there are real benefits to be derived. Uh, so if we can go on to the next one, please. Next slide, please. Just a few uh, concluding thoughts. There's a very, very wide range of applications uh, of metamaterials in, in the aerospace sector where they're going to be beneficial. I think if we're going to get the real, the maximum benefit from metamaterials, we're going to have to consider multifunctionality. And of course, if we're going to do that, we, we need to have underpinning material science. We need to have reliable and rapid design and optimization tools. And as I touched on, we need to have large scale production facilities. And a, a final thought, specifically for the aerospace sector. Um, we need to consider through life support, repair, upgrade. That needs to be part of how we implement a metamaterial in the aerospace sector. And that's really all I've got to say. So uh, I hope I haven't sent you all to sleep. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. We can now hand over to, to Mike Sloan. He's going to talk about uh, his experience as a small medium enterprise in, in developing or integrating some, some metamaterial technology. So over to you. Thanks, Mike. Hi, thanks very much, gents. Let's just check this is working. Okay, good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for your attention. 
I'm a Mike Sloan, Director at Technical Composite Systems. We're an SME uh, in the UK. Um, and this is my talk, Metamaterial Composites, Applications and Opportunities. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail on composites um, because that probably will bore people. Um, and I can't go into too much detail on metamaterials because it's not, it's not actually my expertise. But what I do want to do is, is just talk to you about our journey over the last sort of three, four years, our adventures with metamaterials. Um, and certainly over the next 20 minutes to, to inform and, and to entertain. So over the engineer, I've, I've got a bit of structure for this presentation. I want to start off by talking and, and, and explaining to you who technical composite systems are. Um, it, please don't look at that as a sales pitch because that's not the intention. It's it's really to get into context how an SME gets involved with with SM uh, with metamaterials and and the complex technology that it is and and where we sit and where we see ourselves. So kind of you know our, our little position in in the big machine of of science and innovation. Um, then I'm going to talk to you about how we saw metamaterials when we first started as an SME. You know, so how did we get over that that sort of barrier of actually getting started into a new field of science? Um, the idea of combining metamaterials and composites, so effectively the application. Um, then I'm going to really the core is is the project that that we worked on, the project that we delivered. So I've got some stuff to show. Um, with a really good result at the end. Um, that's actually blossomed into a second project, which, which rolls nicely into, into the opportunity, both immediate opportunity for, for us and Metamaterials, but also the longer term and, and where perhaps we, we think we can go next. So TCS, we are um, a British SME. I'm incredibly proud to be part of the, the British manufacturing industry. Um, innovation is, is absolutely key to our business. It's front and center of our business plan. But as an SME, that doesn't generate immediate cash returns. So we have to balance it carefully between making products and getting them out of the door and generating the products of the future. So we are um, AS9100 accredited for design and manufacture of all tooling, composites and injection molding. And we're both active members of uh, the NCC up in Bristol and um, our trade association, Competence UK, both, um, both excellent organisations. So um, TCS is part of um, the CSS group of companies. That's three companies, all privately owned by the same directors, um, all based on the same site. So we're um, Paynton in Devon, beautiful Devon in, in southwest UK. Um, Paynton's in Torbay or Torbados, as the locals like to call it. Um, the three companies occupy the two buildings I've highlighted there. Um, we've rapidly run out of space. Um, uh, and I've got great things planned that I'll touch on in a second. But the three companies are Technical Composite Systems, which I'll, I'll speak more about in a second. We've got Investment Casting Systems, which is our tool room. So it's CNC machining of very accurate fixtures, dyes, mold tools, um, predominantly injection mold tools. And that feeds nicely into the third company, which is our injection molding arm of the group, which injection molds aerospace, composite, uh, aerospace components and uh, large consumer um, reusable tote bins. I talked about us running out of space. Well, we need to plan for the future. So this is an artist's uh, uh, um, a designer's impression of our new building. This was about two years ago. Um, it's a site about half a mile up the road overlooking Paint and Zoo. Um, this is how they predicted it would look. And here's the building about two weeks ago, and it's not it's not bad, apart from um, a little bit of a of a leaky roof, some some utility problems, and uh, access road issues. You know they've got the building in the right shape, and we're due to be in their Q2 this year. So sixty thousand square feet for the group. It's a real asset to to our ongoing manufacturing and, and expansion. So what do we do? So we're an SME and technical composite systems. That, that's kind of the clues in the name. We we, we specialise in composite materials. That covers a wide range of, 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 of family of, of materials, short fibre, long fibre reinforced. Um, there's a couple of pictures of, of me both outside and inside the autoclave. That's a, that's a carbon fibre component we've made for uh, a defence application. That's a cover. And effectively, we will, we will build to print. You know, we will work with our customers and, and take their drawings and deliver exactly what they need. Or we will start with concept designs, help with choice of materials, design for manufacture 
the false tooling suite, assembly tools, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, it's, it's it's standard composite processes, but I genuinely believe we do those processes very well to the absolute best of our abilities. Here's Barney um, laminating a, a prototype component for an aircraft interior. This is a um, a glass epoxy component with uh, a 3D machined Rosel core. It's a really nice little product that one. And there's Greg there checking a uh, cut and fold of one of the honeycomb panels that we've made. So a, a couple of examples of, of sort of subcomponents of parts that we make. But what I really want to get across here is, is everything we do generally is, is layered, it's additive, it's an additive manufacturing process. So it's, it's very hands-on, it's, um, it's quite labor intensive, uh, more so than I would like, more so than I would choose. But we're putting down layers of material in the right place at the right time. And little did we know four years ago that actually this fits really well with one particular uh, theme of metamaterials. So how did they look to us when we first started you know, four or so years ago? Metamaterials is a completely new, relatively new term to me. Um, didn't know much about it at all. I'm an engineer. Metamaterials aren't conventional engineering. They're not something that you find everywhere in nature. Um, they've got repeat periodic structures or surfaces that give us a benefit that we typically don't don't naturally find um, and reading into it, it sounded fascinating it sounded great you know um, the sort of the cloaking and the superhero stuff really captured the imagination but there was a lot of new terms it was a new language and I've used this analogy before it's like going back to GCSE French and, and and gave me quite a few headaches but but we stuck with it we knew it was a very low TRL um, and that for an SME means risk because our business is about product out of the door and delivering to our customers' requirements. We can't spend all of our time um, developing low TRL. So, you know, we knew we had to get involved with, with the experts, but from an SME's point of view, the reality was risk. You know, why should we get involved in metamaterials if it's such a risky business? You know, the results we know are going to be unpredictable. We have to fund this work as a small business. That's our resource, our people, our materials, etc. Um, and it's a lot of hard work and the skills you needed, we knew we would need in abundance uh, a, a, a those sort of enthusiasm, resilience and tenacity. I mean, that's that's a day in the life for any engineer or scientist, really, or, um, or, or daily life. But we knew it would be hard work. That's balanced out with the opportunity because we could see that we can we can up our game with the materials that we could offer. And that innovation would allow us to differentiate ourselves from the competition. It was never going to be a short term win. Um, but the longer term cash return that we could see, we thought it was worth the risk. And, and, and as I mentioned before, innovation is key to, to me and my business. And, and it, it really did sit front and centre with, with our business plan. So it looked risky. The opportunity was there. We decided to, to crack on and go for it. So here was the idea. Um, it's a, uh, an image I've, I've, I've borrowed from Boeing. But it's a civil airliner 787 and, and as i understand it you build your aircraft you take a nice aerodynamic tube and then you start sticking loads of things onto it antennas so they can be of all different sizes and shapes but you turn a an aerodynamic tube into a, a bit of a porcupine a bit of a hedgehog now looking in a bit more detail if we look down the um the back of the fuselage you can see a, a vhf blade antenna there at the front um but the one really to sort of draw your attention to is that satcom antenna it's quite it's massive actually it's, it's a lot bigger than it looks you know that is an aircraft the scale is a bit deceptive um but it's a it's a big antenna it, it sits out in the airstream it's you know it's potentially vulnerable to damage surely there's a there's a there's a way of improving these of of putting them in a different place making them smaller now there is one conventional approach that's been around for, for quite a few years and that's conformable antennas so take that satcom antenna and sink it into the fuselage so that gray skin on, on on my image there becomes the fuselage surface and the yellow box is is the is the container for the hardware we call it a base plate um, uh, and that is an approach that, that has been used before so i put a slide up saying look you know how cutting edges is are we reinventing the wheel? Well, you take the latest generation fighter plane, that is doing a lot of communicating. I, I've got no idea comparative to a civil airliner. I would hazard a guess it's a, it's a damn sight more. There's nothing sticking out of that. It's all conformal. It's all very 
um, very interesting. So the defence guys are leading the way with, with material developments. Um, we're just doing the very best we can with the resources we've got and the applications that we've got. So I'm not saying that we're, we're absolutely at the cutting edge, but we are doing some very interesting work that I'll show you in the next few slides. So the project, um, you know, we had to sort of ring fence our resource and, and our idea and yeah, top level, um, top level objective was take an antenna system and make it better. How? Well, let's make it lighter. That was attacked through uh, myself and my team with uh, introducing carbon composites, getting rid of aluminium and, and adding long fiber and pre prep materials. And then uh, once we reduce the mass, we need to make it smaller. And that's where the metamaterials came in. Now, I'm going to allude to the project slide. I'll bring this up again. I've, I've, I've graded this out intentionally, but that is the, the conclusion from our project, which was, which was really successful. So, so what did we do? Well, antennas, they do radiate, beam out in multiple directions. And if you want to get the most from your antenna, um, you need to put it in front of the mirror, a um, perfect electrical conductor. So typically, um, the guys often use metal. That can just be a very thin metal foil. Um, and if you want to take advantage of the phase change, you have to space your antenna one quarter of its wavelength away from that mirror. Okay, simple stuff. Now, this is where it starts getting interesting. If you take a, a metamaterial or an artificial magnetic conductor, you can have no phase change on the reflection. So theoretically, you can put your antenna bang on top of, of your ground plane. So what does that mean for this box? Well, rather than having a, a deep box where your mirror, your ground plane is a quarter of the wavelength, you can have a very thin box. And, and both Ian and, and, and Kevin showed that earlier with, with some, some military work that it, it, is, it is being done. Um, we're approaching that for our application and, and our particular wave bands and frequencies. Now, here's the geometry that we took forward to work with. Um, to get it into scale, the diameter of that is about the size of a good family pizza. So it's not insignificant, but look at the depth. You know, that quarter wavelength for a, that, uh, for a given wavelength is, is significant. This was effectively the conclusion from our project. We were able to take our mirror and bring it up to that depth. So that's your head within the aircraft. But we didn't just do that, you know, magically. We had to put in these metamaterials. And this is where um, my collaborators at the University of Exeter came in. We gave them a, a wave band, we gave them a gain, we gave them a whole set of operating parameters and said, please go away, model, design, and help us make some magic. But how did we find the experts? Oh, beg your pardon. Um, this is the conclusion of our slide. So I'll, I'll kind of cut to the chase first. Um, working with Exeter and, um, and Cobham, we actually made, demonstrated and tested a full composite base plate. Um, that's the picture middle left. If it looks a funny sort of copper brownie color, that's because it's got copper in it for lightning testing, which is the middle picture. We, we tortured quite a few of these, these base plates to see how they performed. And the metamaterials, there's, we're, we're alluding to the metamaterials on, on the picture on the right. You'll understand, I don't want to give everything away, but we used a number of frequency selective surfaces and different materials inside of our base plate to give us the performance that we wanted. And, and the message to, to really get across here is, is, is we made a composite base plate, we added metamaterials to it. We took it, for, we took it through a full D160 test, which is altitude, altitude shape, rattle and roll, and it still works at the end. So it's a really, really positive result for the project. But to get this project off the ground and, and in any way moving forward, I know composites, I didn't know metamaterials. So how did we approach that as an SME? Well, we needed to meet the experts. Now, luckily for me, there's, um, there's a really strong team of metamaterial experts at the University of Exeter, half an hour up the road, brilliant. We just made a phone call, started some emails. I had a conversation with, with Alistair, um, ended up meeting him at a KTN event in London of all places, two staff from there, we're going up to London for a meeting. Um, and then with the help of um, the contract research staff at the uni, they enabled an SME to engage with the uni and really bring us together. Then it's a case of, okay, who's gonna support this work, um, which in this project was um, Innovate UK. They did um, uh, a scheme called the NATEP scheme that we applied for. So we pulled together a grant proposal. That's probably the most boring bit, if I'm honest. Um, you know, we just wanted to crack on and do the work. But after a number of peer review panels, um, 
we were awarded some money and, uh, and we got going, we cracked on. So here's our base plate. If I talk to you a little bit more about the sort of the opportunities I see it, um, this was our, our output from the project with our meta material inside. Now, as I've already mentioned, I don't want to, I can't and I won't uh, expand and explode the, the, the makeup and the, the ins and outs of that meta material. I've got it there changing color because after all, it's just magic. Um, that in itself is a layered composite structure. Um, there's a number of different elements that make up that meta material. And, and what's encouraging for me to say is it is very similar to technologies that we already worked with. We didn't know this at the time, but it's a layered structure, maybe half a dozen different components in, in controlled positions, um, very accurately made, um, designed by um, the physicists at the University of Exeter. Um, and we've got an opportunity to improve that even more. So yes, it is a multi-component structure. And if I use my analogy of earlier of food, my favorite things, that base plate is diameter of a, of a large pizza. Think of the uh, meta material that we made inside as, as a layered structure. So that maybe that's like a lasagna or something, you know, it's not the best term, maybe, maybe a tiramisu, uh, 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 a walls, uh, what's the, the layer put in from the 80s? I can't remember. It, it's quite complex, but if we take each of those individual materials, individual component materials of the meta material, we've now got great confidence that we can improve those in turn and make those even better, which then compounds to make the system improve. So um, one thing we are currently doing with the live project, this is the roll on from the first, is investigating those raw materials themselves. So we're now working in the arena of making our own materials, not our own structures, our own materials. And this is very special particles that we're loading into different materials to tune the performance. So if we look at electrical or magnetic performance, we can suddenly up, um, up the results that we previously got knowing the component structure of our AMC. Some of the results we got weren't too great. We, you know, we had a, a complete killing of signals and a complete loss, but that has an application somewhere else. Um, and we can take some of the, the lossy materials, the materials that didn't work so well, maybe change their densities and find a secondary application. So the research, the innovation is going in, in a number of different directions, which for an SME is, is brilliant. And you know, we really value um, not only this arena to present today, but to work with the academic institutions, be part of the Meta Materials Network UK um, and, and do our little bit in driving things forward. I think I've just got some thank yous. Yes, I must thank you. Uh, I must say thank you to, uh, firstly, the panel today and the other speakers, as well as the KTN for the, the invite for this talk. Um, my co-collaborators from the University of Exeter, that's Alistair Hibbins, um, Roy Sambles, Cameron Gallagher, Paul Keatley. Um, thanks to um, the UK Metamaterials Network. And, and really to wrap up, thank you to the audience for listening. Um, please feel free to contact me independently with, with any questions for, for the project or or um, any other applications, or we can take questions um, in the panel session at the end. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mike, that's great. And yeah, just to remind people to, to post their questions. I'm just gonna hand over to, to Martin Agnew from Airbus to, to make a few comments while we get ready to, to address some of the questions that have already come in. So over to you, Martin. Hello, everyone, hope you can hear me. Um, so. What an amazing uh, set of presentations for me and Kevin and Mike. They pretty well have taken nearly everything I would have said at this point. I have no slides. I'm standing in for a colleague. Uh, so I'm going to try and highlight a couple of areas that were not discussed, but also highlight and reinforce a couple of areas that I think are very important. So Airbus uh, is three divisions, Airbus commercial aircraft, you all know. Airbus helicopters, uh, military and civil, uh, manned and unmanned and Airbus Defence and Space, which is a division I'm part of, which is everything else that flies, and we connect together everything that flies, both the helicopters and civil aircraft and everything else, and we process the data from uh, all those platforms. So <clears throat> I'm responsible for disruptive concepts and robotics, and I'm I've been watching the metamaterial space for a very, very long time. Um, all of the things that were discussed today, uh, antennas, low-profile antennas, the number of holes in the fuselage obviously is very important. We want less holes, therefore we want to keep the structure of the aircraft uh, in, in integrity. Low turbulence, uh, you know, re reduced drag and fuel consumption, very, very important. Uh, 
And also uh, something wasn't discussed uh, when uh, Mike was talking about the SATCOM antenna that points out at the top of the aircraft bird strike. It's a very key requirement uh, and uh, anything that sticks out is the subject of collision with birds. And it's one of the most difficult requirements to meet in many cases, as well as the lightning strike requirement. And that involves extra structural material. Uh, and it, obviously that extra structural material is mass and has uh, takes up profile and therefore re uh, reduces the fuel consumption. But also these metamaterials allow you to do more bandwidth for the same antenna, beam steering much further angles off bore site than you would expect. Um, and the installed antenna performance, which Mike talked about at the end, putting an antenna on top of a metal structure usually detunes the antenna. But if you've got a clever surface behind it that, uh, that uh, translates a conductor into a perfect insulator, which is what they're doing, then your antenna installed antenna performance is the same as you'd expect uh, standalone. So, but there are a couple of areas that weren't discussed and, uh, and I think are going to be very important in the very near future. So this sensing and communications aspects, it can, uh, <clears throat> sensing communications and power, I would say, the multifunctional capabilities that metamaterials allow is very important because we want less antennas, less um, uh, apertures in the aircraft, in the satellite, etc. And with a move towards uh, eventually we're going to go beyond 5G to 6G, the key drivers for 6G are, are uh, the, the convergence of sensing and communications and the, uh, the convergence uh, of terrestrial and space-based networks to give you ubiquitous communications all around the Earth. Now, when you start to put up a thousand satellites in space, which we've done in collaboration with OneWeb and, and other manufacturers are doing similar things such as SpaceX, um, every gram matters because every, every kilogram uh, that you launch into low Earth orbit costs a lot of money and a lot of fuel. So anything that can reduce mass, you have a, re a, a limited amount of real estate on the satellites. You saw the, the, the Probo V satellite from Kinetic. We, we, we manufacture loads of satellites in the United Kingdom with Surrey satellites and Stevenage and Portsmouth. Every single bit of real estate matters, uh, as the same is with aircraft. So anything that reduces mass uh, can also add additional functionality is very, very important. But all those things sitting behind it, the thermal management, the structures, they're all very, very important. And the maintainability. So even uh, aircraft, we know about maintainability, maintenance, repair and operations. Increasingly in space, we'll be maintaining satellites and structures. Hence, one of my areas is space-based robotics to build large structures in space. So I cannot reinforce enough what was said by my colleagues. But if you think this is a defense technology which might sneak into civil sometime in the foreseeable future, Remember, the, the lines are very blurred today between defense, what I would call government and infrastructure and institutional in the middle, and civil. And often those platforms are identical, but the cyber security algorithms and, and the, the codes are the only thing that change because we live in a world of interference, uh, accidental or deliberate jamming, even in the commercial space. So... Uh, that those lines are blurred and, and increasingly defense technology is getting applied even before it would be done in defense in the civil space. And, we'll, and you've seen that in 5G and 6G. So I would say to you, this is not a technology for tomorrow. It's a technology for today and very soon because we've had 15, 20 years. And if you know the Gartner hype cycle, you know that there's a hype phase followed by a disillusionment phase followed by a, a reality plateau. And I believe we're past and heading up the reality plateau for many of these technologies. So um, one last word I would say to you is not just RF uh, communications and sensing between platforms. I was the chief engineer for the European Data Relay Service, the world's first commercial laser data relay service between low earth orbiting and geostationary satellites and, and aircraft. That was a novel activity in 2012 when we first kicked it off. These Today we have 12 satellites in space with lasers between them and in the next generation of these mega constellations and the big geo and meo and leo satellites they'll all have laser terminals and the aircraft will as well to give you gigabits tens of gigabits even terabit feeder links from satellites and all of these need mirrors and lenses and 
in if not now but in the very near future if we can do it in the infrared for sensing with metamaterials we'll be able to do it in the near infrared and the visible very soon because you're riding Moore's law because these structures are patterned using semiconductor technology and semiconductor technology is getting smaller all the time so if we can't do it today we'll be able to do it soon and I'm going to stop there and finish off with one last phrase sustainability and net zero we have to reduce and get to net zero as quick as possible and it's not just the fuel systems the, uh, the, 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 the efficiency of the aircraft, but it's also our understanding of the climate uh, uh, and, and the, the ways we're affecting the climate as well. And some of these technologies will allow us to not only sense what the climate's doing, improve the models, but also in real time, allow us to adapt the way we fly uh, so that we reduce our emissions and eventually uh, go to net zero. So I'm gonna stop there and I'll, uh, I'll hand over to Ian to manage the, uh, the questions. Thanks, Martin, that was fantastic summing up uh, and, added, and adding some really important points there, so thank you very much. So we'll try and keep answers to the questions short so that we can get through those that we've got. If people want to follow up, I, I guess there's means through the hub to, to try to make contact um, afterwards. So the first question I think was kind of to me, but I might broaden it out, um, about uh, what's, what's the excuse me, what's the view of the role of metamaterials for Team Tempest? So I guess Team Tempest, for those who aren't aware, is, is a very particular next uh, generation military combat aircraft. So first thing I guess is that's just one specific aircraft in the force mix. So, you know, uh, so just bear that in mind. Um, and so maybe there is a role and I know I point Kevin might want to comment when he was in BAE just a couple of years ago um, for a number of KTN events, um, promoting the interest of BAE systems in, in being contacted by people in the supply chain who might work in this area and also to, to recruit talent, people who understand and know about metamaterials to, to form parts of the team to, to take them into concept demonstrators and, and, and so forth. So I think Tempest certainly provides uh, a context for the application of metamaterials. Whether they make it onto Tempest is, is kind of down to supply chain dynamics and, and technology readiness. Um, but if it doesn't make it onto there, there's going to be a whole host of, of further types of platforms and other generations where they will make it. So I don't know if colleagues on the panel have any further points to add to that. Otherwise, I'll go on. I guess... Um... As you mentioned, Ian, um, I did talk uh, in my BE systems days uh, when I was working on the Tempest project about uh, the advantages of metamaterials. And uh, I, that, that's probably all I can say at the moment. Yeah. Uh, if, I'll move on I, to the next question. Go can ahead, I just sorry. add one, one further yeah. comment to that? So. Uh, obviously, Airbus is, is not part of Team Tempest. We're part of a, a competing consortium um, uh, of our French, German and Spanish colleagues. But uh, eventually, the, I believe these uh, probably will merge and certainly will have to interoperate. And one of the big things we're pushing and uh, is the multi-domain combat cloud. So it's not just about your aircraft. It's the network and the connectivity which allows you to be able to sense and, uh, and, and, and form effect. Uh, and you already see that with the F-35 today, it's a, it's a very networked aircraft uh, and increasingly you're going to see the cloud coming to the edge and each of these platforms has got, uh, has got information it needs to share with the rest so you have a combined capability and all of that involves comms, be it, uh, 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 be it laser, be it RF, be it terahertz, be it low frequency, you name it, it will be used. And for every one of those, there is a direct tangible and almost game-changing benefit with metamaterials, I would say. Thanks, Martin. Um, so the next question um, for, for Kevin, um, on average, how much does Kinetic invest in time and resources from idea to commercialization of a custom metamaterial application? Um, okay, if, if you specify a range, Kevin. Yeah, it's, it depends is the, uh, I suppose rather predictable answer, but it can be many man years. 
it has been and it can be millions of pounds it all depends on what you're doing and what potential reward is as, as with any business uh, in some cases the, the the projects are very small um, perhaps if we're looking at uh, something that's more consumer orientated in some cases it's a very long time uh, in, in terms of man hours and it's a lot of money it's new production facilities and those are all things we've done it depends on what the potential value is for, 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 for kinetic uh, but it, it varies hugely is the answer I, I guess we're in a sort of fairly bespoke phase as well um for, for the metamaterial technology you know i think back to martin's comment about hype curve so you know that's kind of where it is it's, it's a bit more intensive at the moment i guess did anyone else want to come in from the panel so uh, i would just say that the, on, on. The, the 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 thing to remember is it's not just the investment on the military side there's going to be so much commercial investment in the near future if not already uh, you've seen it in 5g uh, you'll certainly see it in five and a half or 6g or hash g is what i refer to it as um, so there will be a lot of money available, be it from VCs, from government uh, and from industry uh, and banks and institutions. The, the, the investment will be there. It's finding the right people with the right skills is the biggest challenge, I would say. There are not enough people who understand this or even understand the benefits to start to know that they've got to learn uh, a new set of skills. Yeah, yeah that, that's, that's actually very true. Something we've been working on quite a bit is, is, is recruitment, is expanding our teams. Uh, and I, I should say in terms of metamaterials, uh, although a lot of the work at Kinetic in the past has been related to defence, uh, we're working on antennas and related systems for the civil market as well. Uh, and that, that's really where we see the major applications being. Um, as, just, as much as I said, everyone wants to be connected everywhere all the time. Um, and we need to do that efficiently, and mass materials are going to be a very important part of uh, achieving that goal. It's a bit flippant, but and picking up someone else's kind of um, name and publicity, um, the metaverse is, is going to be enabled by meta materials, you might say. Um, on to the next question. Um, so I think this is one between, you know, about the Zephyr platform, um, asks the question between Kinetic and Airbus, I'm not sure. We, I would invite you to answer that part, but perhaps could, could that platform, very sort of high altitude lightweight platform, could that be a host for lightweight metamaterial antennas? Um, Kevin, Kevin or, or Martin might yes. want to answer um, that. I've looked at that some years ago, and the yeah. answer is yes. Um, I'll probably Undoubted. move on. Yeah. Undoubted. <laughs> I mean, if you ever think every gram matters, uh, getting into space, getting into stratos into the stratosphere and staying in the stratosphere, you're talking with a Zephyr, it's a, it's a 75 kilogram total mass of the whole platform. There's only two kilograms of metal in the whole aircraft, and it's got a wingspan, the diagonal of a tennis court. So, yes, anything that gives us multifunctionality, because you've barely got a payload capability more than five or ten kilograms. Uh, for sensing, so where are you going to put your comms on? So by definition, your sensing and comms has to be multifunction, and therefore it's an ideal opportunity for for meta materials. Uh, you know, yes, with a capital Y is what I'd say. Thanks. Um, so then, let's uh, move down the list. Sorry, I just uh, switched screen temporarily there. Um, so quick one, maybe a sweet spot price for meta materials in aerospace, or is cost not a factor because if you get maximum benefit? I suspect this is really difficult to answer because you're talking for, from anything from large area applications to very small component and device applications. So, so it's very difficult to give a, an answer or, or difficult to give a range, which isn't just very wide, uh, but very quick comments from anybody. Yeah, unfortunately, that, that is the answer that's the reply I've sent. It depends. Um, and it's, it's, it comes back to the same point I made earlier. Uh, it's all very well having the best antenna, the best field of regard from that antenna. And we, we've been doing that for many years. Um, what matters and what gets it on a platform is 
Does it make the overall platform better? Does it make it more viable? In the long and the short of it, can we actually uh, make more money by incorporating that meta material onto the onto the product? Um, so it, it just depends um, what the benefits are, what the platform is, uh, how valuable uh, savings in weight and volume are. It, it, it just depends on the system. Yeah. So I've got a few questions from Mike because he hasn't had a chance to answer any. So uh, I'll pick up on one of those. Yeah. Um, so one question from Rosario, are there any specific net zero outcomes from um, your research? Any specific net zero outcomes? Oh, the short answer I is, the is no, I can't, I can't give you a quantified answer. Um, Definitely the projects and our work started with the objectives of reducing mass, reducing size um, and aiding installation and maintenance of the, the antennas. Um, now, you would hope to extrapolate that achieving all of those boxes would, would drive on to a, a benefit in net zero, a contribution to it. I haven't got any numbers. I mean, we're, we're still in the stages of, of pushing this forward to getting it onto a platform. So... Um, no, I haven't got any numbers, but certainly the intention is there on those three themes, if that answer's okay. Yeah, uh, it probably links on to the next question, um, whether your composite base plate uh, has been commercialised, and if not, um, have you got a commercialisation plan to deployment? How many have I sold? Uh, well, I'm sitting in my office rather than a white sandy beach. Um, no, it hasn't been commercialised yet, and for for some some life reasons for some for some frustration i think it's it's important to understand tcs doesn't sell direct to the the oems you know we're we're two or three tiers down in terms of the supply chain of the components and the antennas to getting them onto an aircraft um our project was originally set out with a with a um exploitation plan to market um we've steered off in a slightly different direction but because we know how these components are made um, because we own the IP, um, we are taking that forward. You know, we've got the drive and the, the whereabouts to deliver the project. We're not giving up now. So we've got, yeah, we have a route to market now. It will just take a little bit more time. That's all I'll say. So we haven't, there aren't any flying about at the moment, but we're going to drive it and make sure that happens. Thanks, Mike. And, and the next question, which I think might be answered by, by anyone on the panel um, about sort of discussing in terms of having the type of meta material antenna concept that you've got, Mike, but taking that to the actual antenna manufacturers um, in, in the UK, give an indication of, of are there many UK manufacturers, you know, what's what, how many entities, I suppose, in that upward supply chain are ultimate oh, uh, users? Good and, question. And that's why I said um, others can answer that. And I'll start if I can. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit at arm's length from the antenna manufacturers, I would say. But, you know, the work we did with, with the team at Exeter University, we, we'd be very pleased to, to, to have a chat and a, and a discussion with any antenna manufacturers that wanted to come to us and understand what we've done, what we've learned, what we've made. Um, but discussions uh, until now, no, I haven't had any, but you know, as with anyone that wants my base plate on an aircraft, come and have a chat. You know, I, I, I'm all ears. Martin, do you want to comment on, on how many companies might be selling antennas and want to be fed by metamaterial antenna concepts? Well, Airbus and, and our competitors, we're systems integrators. So we make the wings ourselves. We make the fuselage, but just about everything else is is um is installed from our tier one suppliers and uh and certainly cobham is one of our uh, tier ones or tier two suppliers and um that we i always point these people at our tier one and tier two suppliers we're interested in developing capability the cons the customer is constantly asking for new capabilities because it's a rapidly changing market environment uh and it's not i would think as well don't just think commercial aircraft thinking urban air mobility when things are flying around in cities or or delivering things unmanned airborne systems, um, be they drones or, uh, or or air taxis, they're all going to be connected together because they have to communicate. Uh, you know the next uh, change of direction to pick up the next customer, etc. So, 
all these things are potential areas uh, and there's lots of new and interesting companies coming along in that area particularly sponsored by ati and the uk is a really real, real hotbed for that sort of thing so don't just think the big uh, aircraft suppliers but think of the the many or hundreds or thousands of the smaller little things that will be flying around our skies in the foreseeable future and all the ground terminals all the customers we serve on the ground you know, uh, and, and, and backhaul uh, of, of 4G, 5G via SATCOM. Today, most of that's physically, it's, it's good old fashioned, uh, you know, parabolic antenna stuff. This is open for opportunity. You know, there's so many opportunities there, particularly in the mobile and, and, and automotive area where you want to be connected. So, yeah, there's, there's a number of different air entry points there, not just the big platforms, but the smaller platforms and the users on the ground. So there's a thanks. There's a final question from from Stephen Phillips, which some of which may have been answered in part by some of the discussion and talks, but could be taken offline about current challenges of developing low TRL metamaterial applications for dual use structures. LH2 compatibility. I'm not familiar with LH2. What that means, um, and and uh, morphing structures. I think, um, but I think as you just said, Martin, lots of opportunity. Uh, I don't know if anyone wants to make a quick comment before we wrap up because we're slightly over over time. That's probably worth saying Kinetic makes metamaterial antennas and we're investing heavily in the people to do that, in the equipment to do that on a larger scale. And we're looking at, yes, our traditional defence markets, but really also at the civil markets that, that, that the Martins just alluded to. If you look at 5G, you look at 6G, you look at the Internet of Things, how are you going to make better antennas that are smaller and lighter? Are you going to use metamaterials? And we have invested, as I say, in people, in manufacturing capability and the ability to design the precursor materials that allow you to make a metamaterial antenna. Uh, that, that's really uh, something that Kinetic's putting a lot of time and a lot of money into. Thanks. Any quick comments from any of the other panel members? Well, LH2 is liquid hydrogen. And obviously we've uh, made a statement that we're going to uh, achieve in the medium term uh, net zero through liquid hydrogen in the short term with uh, sustainable aviation fuel. But um, all these, uh, I, I'm not sure where metamaterials help with liquid hydrogen other than the thermal situation. It's probably thermal metamaterials they're talking about. And, and yes, we have challenges, but I mean, we do know how to handle cryogenic materials because we build rockets uh, and we fly things in space, which is pretty cold. Uh, and we cool things down to a silly temperature space. But yes, I think there will be rapid deployment of some of these things. Uh, and the other thing I would say is what about metaferrites? You know, the, uh, you know, power transfer motors, all these things. You in one of your presentations, either uh, Ian or Kevin, uh, I think I, I think touched on opportunity, it. and that touches on every area of sustainability. You know, electric motors, electric power systems, uh, wireless power transfer between different uh, parts of the aircraft. Why do we have to have all this cabling? You know, yeah. it's a hell of a lot of copper and aluminium cabling. Um, so yes, uh, I think those real prosaic applications will be there, if not now very very soon thank you so so i'm going to kind of wrap there i think um i just thank the audience thank the audience for their questions and and especially thank the panel um for their excellent contributions um amazingly gelled together really well so thank you for that and and for our ktn support um both in the session and uh, for the event itself so thank you all very much hope you enjoy the other sessions that are available and um I hopefully look forward to meeting some of you in, in due course. Um, bye for now, so thank you very much. <laughs>